what I said was I, I, I thank uh, Professor Chomsky for mentioning the fact that the peace movement has not picked up very much on the slaughter of citizens in El Salvador. However, part of the peace movement has, that part is an organization known as CISPIS, uh, which is a solidarity organization for El Salvador, and CISPIS has in fact been running a campaign uh, since early this spring uh, opposing the bombing in El Salvador. One of the problems is, of course, that um, it's a small organization in the United States, and the Congress hasn't uh, followed along. But I will say that I have brochures outside at the Casa table where you can send money and you can do whatever is possible, and I'm sure Noam can tell you some of the things that we as American citizens can do. But I have brochures describing the bombing campaign in El Salvador and suggesting means for overcoming the bombing campaign in El Salvador. And if everybody would come to the next CASA meeting, which is the first Wednesday uh, in the month of June, right here, 7 o'clock, at the downstairs conference room, we meet every, Wednesday, every first Wednesday and third Monday of the month at 7 o'clock, we'll give you things to do. And I think, as Noam has pointed out, that's our only hope in this struggle. Yeah. I'd certainly endorse that. This is the, really a scandal, the way we've let that go by. Let me just make one comment about that. Duarte, who's the official hero around here, recently announced that he's not going to accept any more human rights charges from the Church Human right, Rights Office uh, to Tala Legal because he said it's allied with people who are controlled by the subversives. That is, the Church is all communists. That's the guy who's the big Democrat. And he also said at that time, that the Air Force is not engaged in any indiscriminate attacks against civilians. It's only engaged in uh, air attacks supporting ground forces. The, op the contrary of that is described in very graphic and gory detail uh, in a series of America's Watch reports uh, in the last couple of months, this one last month, one last August, and one last April. That's the man who uh, everyone is lauding you know, as the next uh, Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, uh, a laureate. Yeah. How do you know like, what's in the secret documents that they're secret? Oh, because, again, this is a very open society, more so than any other in the world, and secret documents do get released. Uh -huh. So the documents that I was quoting, in fact, have all been released. Uh -huh. They were top secret documents, I'm sorry. Uh, there's also a very valuable store of documents which were uh, released, thank liberated, we might say, thanks to Dan Ellsberg, namely the Pentagon Papers. And that's particularly valuable because usually you don't get access to a government's secret documents unless the government decides to release them. That was a case where the government didn't decide to release them. And in fact, uh, they're very interesting. However, I should say that they're not all that different from the public documents that have been released. Uh, we have access, this, you know, I, I don't know what would happen if scholars and journalists ever started using the documentary record. Maybe at that point they'd stop releasing it. But the fact of the matter is they do release it. It sort of doesn't matter too much because nobody ever sees it except some, you know, fanatics. But uh, it's there <laughs> if you want to look. And in fact, it's, there's, there's, you know, there are books and articles discussing it too. Well, you have to remember when it was. That was 1972. And there's some important things to bear in mind here. Uh, by 19, in, in January 1968, the Tet Offensive took place. Now, the Tet Offensive changed the calculation of costs of American elites. They decided, uh, there was a question how to react to the Tet Offensive. The Tet Offensive was an astonishing event. I mean, throughout South Vietnam, in just about every city, there was a coordinated, we, even the, the term is very misleading. I mean. It, it's, you know, the term again reflects the indoctrination system. It's, in, it's a logical impossibility for the South Vietnamese to carry out an offensive in South Vietnam. It wasn't an offensive. It was, a, it was an uprising against the aggressors. That's what we ought to call it. But the Tet uprising uh, took place in a coordinated fashion in just about every city in South Vietnam. The Americans had, we had a, a, over half a million troops there. There were very few North Vietnamese. There were in fact only about 50,000 North Vietnamese mostly at the border, 
they were probably outnumbered at the time by the Thai and Korean mercenaries that we had there, and the United States just dwarfed anyone. Nobody got, had an inkling of it. You know, there's this, hu this coordinated mass uprising in city after city, which the United States, which just was controlling the whole society, had no inkling of. That's an indication of the extent of the popular involvement in it. Uh, they, re it the, the, they now like to say that the result was a victory for the United States, and in a certain sense that's true. The United States had such enormous firepower that it was able to wipe out huge numbers of South Vietnamese. Uh, so in that sense, of course, it was a victory. But it frightened people in Washington. It made them recognize that it was going to be a long, drawn-out war. Well, the question arose as to whether to send more troops. And the deliberations are interesting and instructive. The Joint Chiefs were opposed to sending more troops. And one of their reasons was that they thought those troops would be needed here for civil disorder control. Uh, that tells you something. Uh, they, uh, and they spelled it out. They, they mentioned groups that were going to be a problem. Youth, women, others, you know, literally. You know. Uh, and they literally felt that they had to keep the troops here. You know. Also, the United States the government was worried about that time, about the, at the time, at the fact that the army was collapsing. The American army, much to its credit, I should say, disintegrated. Uh, and uh, that's not a small fact. The United States, again, is unique. Another element of American uniqueness is that other imperial powers have not used citizens' armies for colonial wars. That's unique. It was a bad mistake. Uh, for a colonial war, you need professional killers. You need people like the French Foreign Legion, you know, ex-Nazis. That's what the uh, French used. They didn't send the conscript army to Vietnam. The British didn't use conscript armies. They used professional killers, often hill tribesmen or people who were trained to be professional murderers. Uh, you'll notice in South Africa they do the same thing. A lot of the killing is done by professional killers taken from the oppressed communities themselves. It's very typical, incidentally, a uh, typical colonial practice. The United States made a mistake. It sent a citizen's army. And uh, you can't get ordinary people off the streets uh, to become professional murderers. And that's what a colonial war is. It means going into a village and you know, killing women and children and old men and that sort of business. Uh, so uh, that didn't work, and the army began to collapse, and that was a problem. Well, uh, the also another thing, and here again, it, uh, see, the, a, calcu a decision was made in early 1968, uh, and it's on record, to cut back the war. Uh, that's when Johnson decided not to run and all sorts of things changed. Uh, it was just getting too costly. They couldn't win the war at, an at, a, at, a, at, a, at a, pr a proper cost. Well, then Nixon came in and tried to continue the war, and a lot of the business community was against him, very strongly against him. They felt it was harming the American position in international trade, it was weakening the dollar, it was causing stagflation, it was causing domestic uproar, which they didn't want. They want a nice, quiet population. Uh, and for all these reasons, they really wanted to stop it. There was a real split within the ruling class, if you want. And it's in that context that the New York Times published the Pentagon Papers. Uh, it's also in that context that Watergate took place. Uh, Watergate, which was, in my view, largely a farce, was uh, uh, partly a reaction to what strong elements of the ruling class regarded as Nixon's <coughs> crimes against them. And one of them was just dragging this war on too far when they figured they had achieved what they wanted. You know, Vietnam was not going to recover. Now let's get out and turn to something more important. Uh, however, I should say that the release of the Pentagon Papers, and I think, I don't know how smart the New York Times editors are, but the fact is that the release of the Pentagon Papers had almost no effect because they've been suppressed. They've been suppressed as effectively as if they had never been released. Uh, if you look at the, take a look at the books that are coming out, say Carnot, you know, or certainly the retrospectives, but even the scholarly books, and you'll notice that the material in there is not used. See, in fact, uh, uh, and the material in there just tells the wrong story. For example, the material on the planning is very extensive in the Pentagon Papers, and that's never used. If people refer to the Pentagon Papers at all, which they rarely do, even in scholarly work, it's usually stuff about the mid-1964 or 1965, when there, were, when there were mainly tactical questions. I mean, all the major decisions have already been made. You know, it's only a question of how to implement things. And then you can discuss it. Did we use the right tactics? You know, should we have done it this way, that way? But the major stuff from the late 40s and through the 50s, that's virtually never discussed. Uh, and there's a lot of important material in the Pentagon Papers. I could mention some things, but it's all been suppressed. So it's just as well, it's just as if it didn't get released. Uh, just to give you an indication of this, there's the, uh, the, the 
Beacon Press published the four volumes of the Pentagon Papers, and they published the fifth volume, which is an index. And the index includes a collection of essays on the Pentagon Papers by Gabriel Calco and John Dower and lots of, lots of good essays. I think they're good. I edited the volume. But uh, the, the, it's, it, that volume is practically unsold. A few thousand copies were sold of that volume. And that tells you something. And of course, a lot of the sales are to people who wanted the essays. Now, anybody who's going to use the Pentagon paper needs that volume. You can't use a four-volume work without an index. Okay. So the fact that nobody was buying the volume, including even university libraries, means that they didn't intend that anybody would ever look at them. Okay. And in fact, that's what's happened. Not against, independent of. Yeah, right. I understand, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the question is, why do people vote against their own interests and just in favor of somebody who makes them feel good if they feel disenfranchised? Well, uh, I think that re reflects a certain degree of sophistication, actually. Uh, if you recognize that the election is a PR game and it's for show, and it's sort of fun, like a circus, so you might as well be part of it. Uh, and there's a lot of hoopla, and you know, it's exciting and so on. Then who should you vote for? Well, you know, the guy who has a nice smile, let's say. Or the guy who makes you feel good when you sort of, uh, you know, watch him on television or something. Uh, why not? You know? I think that's probably the way most people think. That's why you, that's why you get to see, every, everyone talks about the Reagan landslide. Well, just take a close look at the Reagan landslide. 53% uh, of, of the electorate voted, way below any other country. Of that, 59% voted for Reagan, which if you do the arithmetic means he got, a, you know, I forget what, like 32% of the vote. Of that, roughly 32% of the vote, about two-thirds, I think it was 60% to be precise, said that they hoped that his, his proposals would not be enacted. Okay? Uh, of the, when the detailed polling was done, of exits from polls when they check people's attitudes, it turned out that about, I think, I forget, I think the figure was about 4% of the people who voted for Reagan said they strongly approved of his programs. What that means is that the landslide consisted of something maybe 2% of the electorate. Okay? That's the landslide everybody's talking about. You know. Now, why did people do it? Well, you know, well, I, I think the failure to vote, I, th I, I think we learned something from the fact that the failure to vote was socioeconomically localized, as it always is. People, you know, the, the people who don't vote didn't see anything in it for them. Uh, of the people who did vote, uh, a lot voted, I mean, some voted because, you know, I mean, like I have friends. In fact, one, one friend of mine who was an ex-Maoist, I should say, uh, explained to me that he voted for Reagan because Reagan's been good to him, which is true. People are, in our income group, Reagan's been very good to. All you do, have to do is look at the redistribution of real disposable income during the Reagan years. And uh, it's a sort of a straight line. If you, if you break the population up into segments, depending on income, you know, low to high, and you ask what's happened to real disposable income, it's going like that. You know, it's fallen for the lowest, risen for the highest, and essentially straight all the way across. So there are people who know that. They can see, you know, the rich can see that stealing from the poor is good for the rich, you know. So they vote for Reagan. Uh, but for much of the population, it's just a matter of, of kind of recognizing the public relations game. You could actually see that. See, the American political commentary is very interesting. So you recall, I mean, you know, you remember the last election. Uh, the, uh, it's like take the debates. Okay, what happened in the debates? But you, take, you remember the commentary on the debates. The commentary was about, like, whether Mondale wore the right tie, you know, or whether Geraldine Ferraro looked down instead of at the camera, you know or whether you know, Reagan could sort of get by in a half an hour without making some totally idiotic gaffe. <laughs> I mean, that was, the, uh, that was the level of the commentary. The, the, nobody talked about any issues because they really couldn't find any issues. You know? And in fact, issues are regarded to be irrelevant. The, the level of cynicism in the, in the national campaigns is really quite remarkable. So for example, during the, at the Kennedy administration, here, here's a case in point. Uh, during the Kennedy administration, in the 1960 campaign, Kennedy hired a firm uh, run by a couple of MIT political scientists, which is how I know about it, called Simon Maddox. Uh, one of them uh, was, in fact, a student of the guy, Harold Laswell, who I mentioned before. And what this 
company was going to do was the following. Just think of this. I mean, the cynicism is mind-blowing. This company, uh, which had a lot of computers and all that kind of business, had broken the population up into a lo lots and lots of categories, you know, like Polish women from 38 to 42 and things like that, <laughs> all sorts of categories. And, what, and they claimed to have a method whereby they could tell for any statement that you made how people in those categories were going to react to it, you know, like whether they would like it this much or that much and so on. And then using, you know, some statistical means and computers and stuff, you could determine the impact across these various <coughs> voting groups of any particular statement you made. And the point of selling this to the Kennedy campaign was that then they could adjust, they could decide what to say uh, on the basis of how you would, it would sort of average out over these various voting groups that they were trying to appeal to. Well, what that means, I mean, that means that a complete understanding that what you say is totally irrelevant to what you're going to do, you know. Well, I think a lot of the population understands that too. And if so, you might just as well vote for whoever makes you feel good, you know, or not vote at all. And so like, Europe is well behind us on this, but they're catching up. They'll have packaged elections too pretty soon by the time they learn the PR tricks that, and the voter management tricks that we've developed. George Bush is being cruel? Yes, yes. I see. It usually went the other way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, all right. That's the same sort of thing. I mean, it's, you know, style is the only thing that counts because they all understand at some level that the substance is elsewhere. And in fact, you know, probably if you sort of look at the last election, it was really a debate over a, there was a, there were policy decisions like should we continue to pour money into military expenditures as a way of revitalizing the economy or should we worry about the debt and so on. That's, those are the real issues, but that's not what people debated. Could you hear? Well, the c comment was that uh, I had said a couple of years ago that probably around 82 that would have been, I guess, that uh, the uh, Russian manning of uh, SAM missiles in Syria and Lebanon uh, raised the power, the likelihood of superpower confrontation. In fact, one of the consequences of the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, Israel used high, sophisticated American technology to destroy a sort of second level uh, Soviet air defense system. As part, of, as part of the attack against Syria uh, during, the, during that war. And the Russians responded, as you'd imagine, by moving in a high-level, uh, sophisticated air defense system and sending, American estimates were about 7,000 Soviet troops to, to, to man them. That number's probably reduced a little bit since. And I, mentioned, I said at the time that that brought the world very close to a superpower confrontation, as indeed it did. Well, since that time, you know, the thing has sort of oscillated up and back. It was, it's was it been worse in some periods, less in others. During the period when the United States was bombing, when, the, say, the New Jersey, Battleship New Jersey was bombing the hills above Beirut, it was very dangerous. They were probably killing Russians. Uh, the Russians didn't respond that time, but it could have blown up. Uh, at, the, at this particular moment, it happened, the tensions happen to have been relaxed a little, and the reason is that the United States has essentially sort of authorized Syria to try to settle the Lebanon problem by itself. Uh, however, it's just on the border. You know? I mean, sooner or later, Israel's going to have to attack Syria. Uh, and they know it. They're discussing it. Uh, and there are very good reasons for it. Uh, in, a, in the situation of military, the, the crucial issue in the Middle East is whether there's going to be a political settlement. Now, the United States is the main factor in blocking a political settlement. That's another thing that's never discussed here. Uh, the United States has been the major element blocking any political settlement there, and of course Israel too, because it doesn't want a political settlement, but they can do it as long as we back it. Uh, and as long as there's no political settlement and there is a military confrontation, Israel cannot allow any Arab state or any combination of Arab states uh, 
to begin to approach it in military strength. I mean, that's just on you know, perfectly reasonable grounds, because if, if there is a confrontation, it could lose and it could get wiped out. So therefore, they're going to have to attack Syria pretty soon. Uh, and they're talking about it, uh, and uh, they're trying to figure out you know, conditions and so on. And that could very well lead, again, to a superpower confrontation. Uh, that area is the area that's really likely to start the, the next world war. This, incidentally, is not just my opinion. It's the opinion of virtually every analyst. So, for example, there was a, there was a secret Air Force document leaked, in this case, whoever asked about these things, leaked the press, but as far as I know, not published in the American press, it was published in the Canadian press, uh, called Air Force 2000, which was a planning, you know, sort of estimating the likelihood of war for the year 2000. And they said, like everybody, that the chance of a war breaking out in Europe is very slight. The chance of a war breaking out in the third world is very high, superpower war. And they said the Middle East is the main area. The Middle East, they said, is, they said uh, what they said is this, as long as the Arab-Israeli conflict is not settled by political settlement, uh, the chances for global peace are remote, and the chance of a nuclear war by the year 2000 are quite high. Uh, for people who are involved in the disarmament movement, I should say, this ought to be their primary concern, if they're reasonable. It's a lot more, I mean, bad enough to have Star Wars and MX and all that sort of business, but this is much more dangerous. for blocking a political settlement? Well, what's the American objective in blocking a political settlement? Well, this is a complicated business. It goes back to what the whole American geopolitical planning has, strategic planning has been for the Middle East. And the, the, the concept that has been developed over the years is that uh, as everywhere in the world, we have, we have the same enemy in the Middle East we have everywhere else, namely the indigenous population. Uh, what's called over there radical Arab nationalism, where radical is a technical term Radical nationalism means the nationalism of anybody who doesn't follow orders. It's opposed to what's called moderate nationalism, which is the nationalism of those who do follow orders. Again, this has nothing to do with political position or anything else. By the late 1950s, uh, again on the basis of secret documents released, uh, we know that the United States had decided, had recognized that to oppose radical Arab nationalism, it would probably be necessary to support Israel as a military force. That position got strengthened through the 60s, uh, uh, especially with Israel's military victory in 67. Uh, and uh, Israel began to be understood as what's now called a strategic asset. Uh, in the context of the Nixon Doctrine around 1970, this was further reaffirmed. The Nixon Doctrine, you remember, was a recognition that the United States could not police the world by itself. We didn't have the power anymore, relatively, to do policing action everywhere. We needed surrogate states. Uh, and in the Middle East, the surrogate states were supposed to be Israel and Iran under the Shah. And American aid to Israel shot up at that point. Uh, by 1979, the Shah had fallen and Israel was left as the last surrogate state. Uh, American policy has been to try to turn Israel into a militarized state, highly militarized state, with lacking an independent economy uh, so that it's completely dependent on the United States for survival. Uh, per it's important for it to be a pariah state, so therefore it can't get support from anyone else and a kind of a pressure, that we can, like an attack dog, you know, that we can use when we need it to guarantee rather narrowly conceived American interests in the Middle East and also to use elsewhere. It's very convenient for a superpower that's trying to run the world by force. It's very convenient for it to have a militarily advanced, technologically advanced uh, state dedicated to war with a trained population and nowhere else to look you know, no other means of survival other than dependence on us. You can use it all over the place. We've used it in Africa and Asia, but primarily in Latin America. So, for example, the massacres in Guatemala in the early part of the Reagan administration, which were enormous, you know, thousands, if not tens of thousands of people were massacred. The Reagan administration was blocked from conducting them directly by congressional human rights legislation, so it was able to use Israel to do it. And that's valuable for a superpower. Uh, and suddenly the people who support this position are called supporters of Israel. That's another nice Orwellian phrase. They're actually supporters of Israel's destruction, you know, because that's what it's leading to. Uh, but uh, that's another story. Uh, that's, I think that's the sort of encapsulated, the thinking behind it. And of course, that's inconsistent with the political settlement. 
a political settlement would just mean that Israel would be, you know, something like the Switzerland of the Middle East. But that's no use. We want it to be the pressure of the Middle East. And that requires a military conflict. So we've blocked any political settlement. A political settlement would mean that Israel would have to withdraw to something like the 67 borders. And then it would be, you could have a police, peace, peaceful settlement in those terms, but not with a really powerful military state there that can be, that's in a state of conflict and therefore, you know, it re requires military support and is available for military uses. Pardon? Oh, I'm sorry, I can't see very well up there. Yeah, could you? Well, for one thing, I'm not sure they're all that aware, uh, but basically they kind of agree with it. You know, the, the Soviet Union, since in, in the Second World, during the Second World War, the Soviet Union, we don't have their documents, but we can see pretty well what they were up to. The Soviet Union has been in favor of uh, uh, what is called detente. Detente is a sharing in world management on the part of the two superpowers, where each one, I mean, where they are, of course, the junior partner because they're weaker, but where e each allows the other to run its, its own domain without too much interference. So we allow them to run their domain and they allow us to run our domain, most, most of it. And that's essentially what they've been pressing since the late 40s, without too much change, incidentally. A little picking away at the periphery, but uh, essentially that's Soviet policy. We occasionally ag agree to that, like during the years of detente, in the early 70s, we for a period agreed to that. But then for various reasons, mainly having to do, I think, with the domestic economy and the need for intervention, uh, we pulled away from it. It's not very pretty, but it's, you know, you can understand it. very hard to give an answer to that. I think we ought to, well, obviously what you try to do is change the policies as much as you can through existing structures. And it's hard to predict the extent to which they'll be resistant to that, but I think they will be resistant to it. Uh, but quite independently of that, I think we ought to change the internal institutions of our own society anyway, because they're oppressive and uh, uh, in many ways intolerable and inhuman. So even if it turns out, contrary to what I believe, that you could make a serious change in foreign policy with our present institutions, we ought to be trying to change them anyhow. <laughs> Again, Syria, well, it depends what you're talking about. For example, one thing that we ought to overcome, I think, I mean, it's, to me, it's, I, I was talking about this this afternoon if you were here, but uh, I don't see an enormous difference between a, a society in which you have to sell, in which you sell yourself to someone and a society in which you rent yourself to someone. I mean, they seem to me approximately equally inhuman. Well, we agree now that we didn't 100 years ago on the first, that slavery is wrong. But there's another thing which in the old days used to be called wage slavery, which means that you rent yourself to somebody else in order to survive. It means that control over resources and production and investment is in the hands of a, a, a separate, a, a particular and rather small group of people and everyone else has the choice of either dying or rent th renting themselves to them, more or less on their terms. Uh, and I, that seems to me a totally intolerable form of human life. You know? I mean, there's no reason to accept that any more than there was a reason to accept slavery or feudalism or whatever. Uh, and uh, that, yeah. You know, you, how do you change that? Well, you try to change it through existing institutions. You probably fail, in which case you change the institutions, which are not graven in stone. You know, history hasn't come to an end. <laughs>
sources? Are there information? Or, yeah. Uh, well, first, let, let me say that I think when you read anything, including, you know, what I write uh, specifically, you got to remember that everybody's got an axe to grind. You know, and history isn't physics. You know, I mean, in physics, the world pretty much controls what you do and makes you honest. You can't lie in physics. You'll be caught very quickly. Uh, but history isn't like that. You know, you can lie for a long time and nobody will ever catch you. Uh, and uh, the, the reason is that, you know, the, the intellectual structure of the field is not such that you got the real constraints of the outside world. So you pick and choose, you know. You pick and choose from a mass of stuff and you pick what you think is important. And there's a lot of subjective judgment and there's a lot of ideology. And that should be understood. What that means is that anything that you read uh, I, I try to be as upfront as I can be about where I stand. There's also something called objectivity, which is a total fraud. And what that means is uh, accepting the ideology of the established system. That's called objectivity. Uh, but uh, you should recognize where somebody's coming from and what they think is important and what their values are and what they're looking for and so on and so forth. And then you've got to compensate for it. And there you just have to rely on your own intelligence and understanding. There's no answer. And that's no matter what you read. Uh, that having been said, uh, there are two points that ought to be made. One point is that the mainstream uh, indoctrination system happens to contain a lot of information. It does for two reasons. For one thing, because there are people who have to know the facts, like business. Business has to know the facts. they got a lot at stake. You know? And so when you read the Wall Street Journal news, news reports, not the commentary, when you read the news reports, they're probably pretty accurate. Uh, and the same is often true in the New York Times news reports. Now, you've got to know how to read them, you know. So you have to read defense of South Vietnam as attack against South Vietnam, you know, and things like that. Uh, but once you understand how to read them, you know, then you can get a lot of information out of them. Uh, and, of course, you've got to read carefully. Like, you have to compare today's lies against yesterday's lies, and, you know. Some, or, for example, you read government denials. When you read government denials, you're often learning what in fact happened. Quite typically, they will not refer to an event, but they'll refer to the government denial of it, and then you check back and you, know, you find it happened and so on. So there's all sorts of techniques for, for you know, penetrating the, uh, the major media. On top of that, there are also, you're, of course, better off if you read widely. So if you, ha if you can, say, read, you know, for example, the Manchester Guardian, even the weekly edition, uh, you will learn things about, say, Central America that you won't read in the American press. Uh, it's uh, like the British press. It's not because Britain is such a wonderful country. It's just that they don't happen to be the guys who are committing the crimes in Central America, so therefore they can write about them more openly. Uh, and uh, uh, if you read journals like, say, The Nation, especially people like Alex Coburn, uh, you'll learn an awful lot that will never be in the American press, or even if it's there, nobody's going to understand it, you know. Uh, but he does, and, uh, uh, or, you know, in these times, in such journals, we'll have things that either won't have, like, for example, uh, terror in El Salvador has been described in, in these times and in The Guardian, uh, but not in the mainstream press. That's always been true. At the time of the Tonkin Gulf incident, for instance, when the whole, which was a real turning point in the war, total fraud, government claimed that, that American ships had been attacked, and that was the start of the big attack in Vietnam, the press, the mainstream press brought, bought it 100%, but The Guardian didn't and told the truth, in fact. And that turned out to be the truth. I mean, the American, the New York Guardian. Uh, of course, uh, you always have, you know, you always read those things with skepticism, like anything. But nevertheless, uh, there are times when they'll report things that the mainstream press won't report, or they'll understand things that the mainstream press won't understand. But ultimately, I don't think there's any substitute for uh, just uh, diligence and intelligence and, and skepticism, a lot of skepticism. Now, see, that's one of the ways in which people are kept ignorant. You can have all the information there, but only a very small number of people are in a position to put forth the effort to try to figure out what's going on. You have to be very privileged, you know, quite privileged before you can even do this. You have to have resources. You have to have training, you know, you have to have time, you know, you have to have all sorts of things that most people don't have in order even to be able to figure out what's going on. That's one reason why the country is sort of safe in having a lot of information available. 
only a very few people are going to be able to get at it. And, you know, that's why you need organization. I mean, if you can group together in organizations, you can do what individuals can't do. That's crucial. That's one reason why the United States has always attempted to block things like political parties or meaningful organizations in which people can participate. Because that's the way in which isolated individuals can overcome the lack of resources. The only way. So go to the next CASA meeting. Sorry, I can't hear. Well, do I think that the moves by Israel, Jordan, and Egypt are orchestrated? Not really. I think it's sort of a dance, if you like, but I don't think it's orchestrated by the United States. It can't possibly get anywhere. It can't get anywhere because the United States won't tolerate a political settlement, period. So it doesn't matter what anybody does over there because uh, we, we play the decisive role. Uh, and uh, a everybody knows what a political settlement means, and everybody knows that it's been attainable for at least a decade. A political settlement means a two-state settlement on something like the pre-June 67 borders with recognized borders and gar territorial guarantees and all that sort of business. That's what a political settlement means. It would probably work. It support it may not be very pretty, you know, it may be very ugly in fact, but it would probably work. Uh, it's supported by virtually everybody in the world. It's supported by the Soviet Union, by Europe, by the non-aligned countries, by the major Arab states, been supported by the mainstream of the PLO for about a decade. Uh, it's only blocked by two categories of rejectionists. Uh, one, who we call rejectionists because they're the bad guys, is, say, Libya, for instance. The other, who we don't call rejectionists because it, uh, it's us, is the United States and Israel. And the United States and Israel have, in fact, led the rejectionist camp. They refuse this settlement. And Israel can do it because we support them in their refusal. And short of that, there is no political settlement. You know, and uh, there is no... It is impossible for any group in Israel to uh, gain any credibility in their own society in favor of a political settlement until they get some support from the United States. The country is just too dependent on the United States. So American opposition to a political settlement, uh, which in fact is crucially centered in the Jewish community and the other so-called pro-Israel communities, uh, that blocks the possibility of any group in Israel arising that could even push for a political settlement there. And so that means there'll be continued conflict, no matter what, you know, no matter what negotiations are going on. But you, you can see, I mean, this again, you know, here, here's another example of the, of the, the take, take, look, something quite dramatic happened about a year ago in this regard. Uh, about last April and May, and it tells you something about the press. Last April and May, uh, Yasser Arafat proposed explicitly uh, um, negotiations with Israel leading to mutual recognition. He proposed that in uh, statements that were widely publicized in, in France, in England, in Greece, uh, in Asia, all over the place. Uh, Israel, of course, immediately rejected it. They don't want mutual recognition. Uh, the United States ignored it. Now, what about the press? Well, the press was fascinating in that case. The New York Times and the Washington Post, that is the national press, they didn't even report it. They literally didn't report it. Uh, they refused to run op-eds on it. They refused to publish letters about it. One reader in Detroit wrote a letter to the New York Times in which he said, look, you guys are always dumping on Arafat because he won't negotiate. Here he has announced negotiations. He wants negotiations and mutual recognition. Don't you think that ought to be reported? He actually got a letter back from the foreign editor of the Times, which is very rare. You never get a letter back when you write to the journal. Uh, and even and from, particularly from a foreign editor, and I, I have the letter, in fact, I'm publishing it. Uh, the letter is amazing. It says, uh, we are familiar with the statements by Yasser Arafat that you um, uh, pointed out to our attention. Uh, however, they do not represent a significant change in his position, which incidentally is true, although you wouldn't know that from reading the New York Times. Uh, and then it goes on to say, if Arafat ever calls for uh, negotiations and mutual recognition, you'll read it on the front page of the New York Times. Well, that's verbatim what he had called for, okay? 
Now, you just couldn't have a clearer statement saying that at the top editorial level, they're not going to allow this to be part of history. Okay. All right, that's the New York Times and the Washington Post. The, the sort of local quality press, like, say, the Boston Globe or the Philadelphia Inquirer or the LA Times, they reported it. But they reported it in such a way that, you'd, you know, you've got to really look hard to find it. It's there, you know. So you could find it if you look. The San Francisco Herald, or Herald Examiner, I think it's called, which has the reputation of being at the worst paper in the country, had a front page headline, an inch and a half high, running all over the front page, saying, Arafat to Israel, let's talk, followed by a long UPI story, which gave all the details. Well, that's the way it should have been treated in the press. Now, how come? How do you explain this? Well, I, would, I think it's very easy to explain. Uh, the point is that the San Francisco Herald Examiner is too unsophisticated to understand what news has to be suppressed. <laughs> so they just make judgments, you know, on the basis of, sig of significance. But the New York Times understands very well. See, the New York Times, you have to understand, this is somebody who's talking about reading the press. See, that when you read the New York Times, you have to recognize the tremendous burden, you know, the awesome burden that the editors bear. Namely, they are creating history. History is what appears in the New York Times archives. Nobody's ever going to look at the San Francisco Herald Examiner archives, right? But they are going to look at the New York Times archives. If you're a scholar, you know, what you do is you go to the New York Times archives. So it's extremely important to make sure that the right things are there and not the wrong things, because that's history, and history is important, you know. So, you know, again, like I say, it's kind of an awesome burden. You've got to respect those guys. And uh, uh, you can see, if you read the press carefully, that there's a difference in the way the Times treats crucial issues and the way other less sensitive papers do, because uh, they have to make sure that history reads the right way. So, th and this just wasn't allowed in history. Obviously, that can't be allowed in history, you know, so it's out. And you'll never find it in a book, for instance. Oh, okay. Well, that's all true. We're going to run out of oil. I mean, you can worry about the timing. Uh, there have been no big surprises in, about this, I should say, for about 30 years. By the late 1940s, the oil companies, who are the only people who have the information, apparently knew pretty much where the oil was and how it was going to last and so on. And it's kind of interesting to see what they did about it. Uh, one, of the things, see, one of the things that's very important to realize when you're studying foreign policy planning or even business planning is that it's all done in the short term. People very rarely make long-term decisions. That's incidentally inherent in capitalism. Uh, if you're in a competitive capitalist economy and you make long-term decisions before you've ever gotten to the long term, you've been wiped out in the short term. You know, like if General Motors, let's say, starts putting resources into something that's going to pay off in 10 years, they'll be out of business in two years because Ford will be working on a two-year plan. So the net effect is that planning is almost always very short-term. And that carries over to state planning, too, which is largely by corporate executives. Well, all right, with that background, and so that, has, that has to do with a lot of things. Like, take the arms race. I mean, anybody who thinks knows that the arms race is going to blow up and we'll all get killed. But that's in the long term. And we only plan for profitability in the short term. That's, in, that's inherent in the system, you know. Uh, well, take the oil business. Uh, it was... Everybody in the oil business knew in the early 1950s that American reserves were limited. Uh, the United States, and the, North, the Western Hemisphere, well, you know, the northern part of the Western Hemisphere was in fact the world's major oil producer until 1968. But everybody knew that's going to run out and that the major oil reserves are in the Middle East. Well, you know, if you were thinking about long-term American security, what you would do is protect American reserves and use Middle Eastern reserves. They did exactly the opposite. What they did is set up, you know, they set up the tax system and all sorts of crazy things so that it was more profitable to exhaust domestic American reserves before turning to Middle Eastern reserves. Well, you know, from the point of view of, say, a 10 or 20 year period, that's crazy. Obviously crazy, you know, in terms of security or anything else. But that's what they did, and they did it because, in fact, various considerations of short term profitability dictated that. Well, uh, sometime they're going to run out of oil. 
and nobody's thinking about it because that's too far off. You know, we make sure we carry out problem. We carry out short-term profitability considerations. There's very little conservation going. I mean, there's some. You know, insofar as the economic system forces it, there's conservation, but not rational planning for conservation. You know, it's just again profitability considerations impose market considerations impose a certain degree of conservation, but real long-term planning about sane use of energy, that doesn't exist. And in fact, you know, if we were really, if they were even moderately serious about this, we'd recognize that, you know, while conservation may be okay for the industrial countries, it doesn't mean anything for the industrializing countries. I mean, they have to have resources of energy, the kind that we had during the period of industrialization. And we're going to let them have it, you know. That's one of the reasons why they probably can never get out of the trap of underdevelopment. So these are, yeah, I think you're quite right. That's a very serious long-term problem. But until there's rational planning for human use in the industrial countries, it'll just be irrelevant. Well, you happen to know if it's true that somebody found a way <clears throat> to turn water into hydrogen through other than fusion reactions? I've heard things like that, but I assume they're untrue. I, I don't mind a big expert on it. but I. I think it's very unlikely that you get outright deception inside the scientific community. Not because scientists are such wonderful people, but because, as I said before, the world doesn't let you get away with it. So one of the fields in which you have to be honest is physics. You can't get away with it otherwise. So I tend to be suspicious about such things. But, um, yeah? Counteract it yes. with personally, you mean, yeah. or what do I counteract? Get? Well, things like this. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think what's encouraging is that there are lots and lots of people out there who really want to do something to change things. And you know, what could be more encouraging than that? You know? are, there enough to bring about change? are there enough to bring about change? Well, you know, that's not the kind of thing you speculate about. That's the kind of thing you try to do something about. see, you know. Let's try to make there be more people. I mean, look, if you think about it over a longer period, the change is very striking. For example, when the peace movement began in the 60s, somebody mentioned before, reminded me today that I was very pessimistic then. And in fact, I was. I used to spend my evenings going to talk uh, in the homes of people who would bring together two or three neighbors, because that's the biggest group you could get, you know. Or we'd set up meetings in churches where we bring together like six topics, you know, Vietnam, Venezuela, Iran, you know, et cetera, et cetera, hoping that out of that collection of topics we could get enough people so that the people there would outnumber the organizers, you know. That was going on as late as 1965, I should say. And then blew up, you know. Now the thing is totally different. You know, now everywhere you go there's lots and lots of people. The level of sophistication and understanding is way beyond what it was in the 60s. And also I think the level of commitment. Like, look, Take the civil disobedience in last week on the Pledge of Resistance. Uh, there were in Boston, a, it's very hard to get information around the country because one of the lessons the press learned in the late 60s was not to report demonstrations since that has a stimulative effect. If you think you're alone, you may not do things. If you know everybody's doing it everywhere else, you'll do it too. So that stuff is never reported anymore. But uh, in Boston, but you know, locally you can see what happens, so it doesn't matter. In Boston, about I think probably 600 people or so were arrested in a sit-in in the uh, federal building over the embargo. And I think that that's the largest civil disobedience action in ever that I remember in Boston. Uh, well, you know, that was over an embargo after all. It wasn't over B-52 bombing. Now, that's pretty impressive, you know. Uh, it means that there's a tremendous difference between, it was a, you know, in fact, the thing never got to that point during the 60s. And, you know, that means that there's been a big change. So are there enough people? Well, you know, there are a lot more than there were. And I think there will be a lot more yet to come if people work on it. Hi. Um, you mentioned, you've talked a lot about um, the spectrum of opinions that are dictated by the media and also um, objectivity and, and the, the uh, 
fact that it doesn't really actually exist. I wanted to talk just for a minute and have you address the issue of emotionalism, which is a double-sided issue. I thought you were going to go into it when you mentioned Vietnam and the, the retrospectives that are going on right now. You see a lot in the media right now about um, honoring the Vietnam veterans, and I certainly wouldn't want to give the impression that I was not honoring the Vietnam veterans. I have family members that were killed in Vietnam. And, but at the same time, I wanted to point out that that is something that's going on now, and I've noticed an uprise of it in the last couple of years, that um, it's, it's okay to be a hero now. In fact, it's really the good thing to do is to go out there and um, kill people in other countries. And on the other side of that coin of emotionalism is the fact that it's very much frowned upon being emotional is very frowned on, upon. The objective papers, the ones that go into the archives, are the ones that are trusted by people who are moderate people. Um, people who are related to me, family members, have told me that um, Israel and Israelis are um, unreasonable and irrational, and that's why they are so militaristic. They've also told me that people who come from Latin America are too emotional, and that's why they have so many problems down there. And I feel like that that's something that's supported in our press, too. Um, how do you feel about that? Well, uh, first of all, let me, the, I mean, I don't think there's obviously nothing wrong with being emotional. You know, you'd be dead if you, you can't <laughs> look at things that are happening and not react to them emotionally. But of course, you also have to uh, try to be rational. It's, there's no use giving the weapon of rationality to the enemy. That's too strong a weapon, you know. So, uh, yes, obviously, well, you know, in fact, uh, uh, Hume once said that reason should be the slave of the passions, meaning you start with your emotional commitments, but then you act rationally to try, you know, within those commitments. That's sort of right, I think. Uh, as far as the, you know, various societies of the world are concerned, I suppose the United States and maybe sectors of Khomeini's Iran are the craziest societies that exist. <laughs> you know? So, uh, I mean, for example, it's very hard to find anything anywhere in the wor world outside of maybe, you know, Khomeini's fanaticism that corresponds to mainstream American intellectual life. I, I mean that quite seriously. You know, I mean, a place where a president can get up and say that the destruction is mutual, so we owe Vietnam no debt, uh, that the, the educated community that can hear that is kind of off the wall. You know, not even, no point in talking to them anymore. Uh, or a place, or in fact, you know, you, you, or, or a place where the president can get up and say, as he did last week, that Nicaragua poses a military threat so severe that we have to have a national security emergency, and people don't break out in hysterical laughter. Uh, that country is somewhere off to the lunatic side of Iran. You know, uh, I don't know of anything like that stuff anywhere else in the world. You know, it's just totally crazy. You know, and so among American in educated intellectuals, I mean the concept of rationality is irrelevant because fanaticism is much too high, you know, jingoist lunacy is much too high, and so on. Uh, so, uh, and all this talk about moderates and, you know, the Latin Americans, and so on. You know, I think almost any Latin American peasant understands more about the United States than almost any political science department. Okay. So, uh, that's, uh, I'm, I'm not joking, I mean that seriously. Uh, there was another point that he made, which I forgot. I was talking about the Vietnam retrospective. Oh, yeah, the Vietnam veterans. Well, you know, uh, first of all, I don't think that, it, I mean, should you honor people for doing what they're sort of forced to do? I think you should pity them. I don't see why you should honor them exactly. Uh, uh, the people you should honor are people who showed particular courage, like resistors. <laughs> and they should be honored. But, uh, You know, but of course they're not going to be for obvious reasons because uh, people in power don't want resistance. What they want is obedience, so they're going to honor obedience. Now that doesn't mean that you should revile people who did what they were forced to do. You should pity them. You know, you should support them, recognize that they have a tough life, and support them. And that's what happened mostly during the peace movement. Well, this stuff that's going on now about, you know, this, uh, this sort of the kind of hysterical business about uh, uh, you know, uh, it's like what's going on in Santa Barbara, if you read that, where they're having a big revival session where uh, they organize thousands of people and veterans come up and they talk about how terribly they were treated by this or that, the hippie and so on. Most of that stuff is invented, in my, in my opinion. 
or if it wasn't invented, it may have happened. I'm not saying people didn't have the experiences, but it was outside the peace movement. The peace movement was very clear about this. The peace movement was always very, and those of you who are, say, my age and so on will remember this, the peace movement was always very clear about the fact that the soldiers were victims. And nobody was calling them baby killers when they came back, at least nobody who was connected with the peace movement. Now, you know, there may have been all sorts of marginal peripheral things, but most of this stuff is being concocted and uh, built up uh, and uh, as a kind of a manufactured hysteria for essentially jingoist purposes. Uh, uh, well, you know, I don't think there's much. I don't know, really. I mean, I suspect that, see, I don't think, see, it's very hard to, see, in fact, you take a look at the, I, I don't believe about the soldier's guilt. The guilt was not the soldier's. In fact, again, let me say that the, well, see, it's very hard. Look, if you're, it's okay when you're sitting here, you know, to talk about what you should do in the field. But if you're out, you know, trekking through the jungle, and there's an eight-year-old kid there who may kill you, it's hard not to kill him first. You know, now that was always understood. Uh, and in fact, again, if you take a look at the peace movement literature, you'll see that there was very little discussion of things like, say, Milai. Like, for example, I wrote an article on. Me lie, and I mentioned it in about one line. What I talked about is what's happening in Washington. That's where the criminals are. You know, the guys who are out in the field, there's nothing much they can do. You know, it's, you, it's very hard under, you know, conditions of combat to make discriminations. Even, yeah, well, maybe. Maybe. I, th I think there's a lot of manufactured hysteria going on. In fact, I was talking to a Swedish reporter uh, a week or two ago, who was going around the country. Uh, she was, uh, and she went to these Santa Barbara sessions in particular, which are the major ones. She told me it reminded her of the Nuremberg rallies in the 1930s under Hitler, you know. And I think that's going on. There's a lot of manufactured hysteria and, uh, uh, you know, stab in the back business and so on and so forth. And that's no joke, you know. Uh, I think one should be very cautious about uh, uh, you know, about, uh, I think one should understand this. It's part of the way of building up more jingoist hysteria. How do you feel about Berkeley and the Attorney General writing at the Berkeley Well, uh, Berkeley, for example, the question is about Berkeley going for Reagan. Berkeley was always a very conservative town. I was in, I taught in Berkeley in 66 and 67, which was the peak of things. And the, the, a lot of young people were involved in the movement, but you know, not wealthy professionals. Berkeley is now a, a yuppie town. You know, it's wealthy professionals. Why shouldn't they vote for Reagan? You know, he's the guy who stuffs their pocket by stealing from the people down in the flats, you know. So, you know, but on the other hand, uh, my daughter's a student at Berkeley, in fact. And nothing's getting reported, but she's been sleeping out on the steps of Sproul Hall lately on the anti-apartheid demonstrations. And uh, she told me the other day that about 7,000 students were involved in a meeting there. It's quite a lot. You know. I've, I've given talks in Berkeley in the last couple of years. There's always a lot of people interested. I mean, you know, the, Berkeley did change. And I think it, it's kind of a, it's, it's not an accidental change. I mean, I think it was a partly manipulated change. There's been an off, uh, young people have been subjected to a tremendous propaganda campaign in the 70s, and it's had some effect. I mean, the, 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 uh, what was considered most frightening in the 60s was the fact that young people acted on honest impulses, and that's scary. So one thing that was done in the 70s was to concoct this uh, narcissism story. You know, one of the big PR jobs in the 1970s was to try to convince everybody that you're narcissistic. You know, you don't care about anybody else. Uh, of course, everybody, every individual knew it wasn't true of that person. But, you know, each person knows it's not true of myself, you know. But what you're told is the whole culture is narcissistic, you're only supposed to be interested in yourself, and so on and so forth. Therefore, everyone feels, well, I must be weird, you know. So I better play that game too. And the net effect is, uh, you know, uh, that, the, that it does become a cultural pattern. But I don't think it's really deep-seated. Uh, next time around. Yeah.
Well, after all, that's a big effect. See, as far as the Tea Party is concerned, uh, the administration is much tougher and meaner, and that's not because you know it's because the, the objective situation has changed. Central America is a much more. Uh, you see, Vietnam is kind of a peripheral interest. The United States would give up trying to conquer Vietnam, and nothing much would change in the global scene. Central America is uh, uh, the major area designated for American robbery and has been for a long time. It's not just a matter of robbing their resources. I think the United States is planning to uh, turn the center of the Central American economies objectively more powerful every year, but relatively it's weaker than it was 20 years ago. You know, 20 years ago, the United States, for example, they, they're still, the United States still really dominated the world, but that's not true. Now you can't have the great societies at home anymore. So you just have the grand designs abroad, and that means you have to be tougher at home. Uh, that's what's called neoliberalism or neoconservatism, and that's a reflection of objective circumstances. Reagan is pretty much Kennedy adapted to current objective circumstances. Uh, and uh, uh, hence, I think that people who are undertaking civil disobedience, and you know, I think you should, uh, should recognize that it's, uh, it's, it's a serious undertaking. Yeah, I didn't see it.